without further ado, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the equipment that's used in production of polyurethane foams. And we've talked a lot about polyurethanes. The one thing I want to add about it is that polyurethanes, while they're not the largest manufactured class of polymers in terms of volume, production volumes, they are by far the most versatile. And that comes about from just how broad the spectrum is in terms of applications, which comes from how broad and versatile the performance features, the physical properties are of these products. So I have a good friend who I was in grad school with, and probably one of the smartest people I know. And after he got two PhDs, he decided to go to law school just for fun. And now he's one of the top patent lawyers. And what he tells me is that, ironically, while you don't learn a lot about polyurethanes while in school, if you search the published literature, especially the patent literature today, there's more about urethanes than any other class of polymers. So even though they've been around since, what, 1937, John? We're only scratching the surface of innovation when it comes to urethanes. And the reason I call this a history lesson is because for the folks that are watching this as, as um, new talent that's potentially going to enter this, this industry, folks that perhaps are still students in school, by the time they get here, this will be the way we did things in the past. New folks are going to do things in a much different way. You're going to develop new technology that's going to be safer, more efficient, more productive, and much higher quality than what the way we do things today. So let me um, proceed. Actually, maybe start. But um, one, of the, one of the sections that I added to this is uh, nucleation. So we'll go into that first. And then I'm going to go into uh, the equipment, beginning with lab scale equipment, pilot scale equipment, then the slab stock machines, continuous, discontinuous, molded foam. And um, then we'll go on to, to fabrication. Of course, we'll finish with safety. So nucleation. Why am I adding nucleation? Of course, this entire session, is, we've talked about polyurethane foams. And one thing that I think we all learned as infants is um, to make foams, we need <coughs> bubbles. And so every piece of equipment, and pretty much the entire, the entire presentation from this point forward, a main aspect of it is going to be how we develop, how we create bubbles, and how we control the bubbles and stabilize the bubbles. So all the equipment has to do, one of the main functions of the equipment that we use to make polyurethane foam is how we, stay, how we nucleate the foam, and then how we stabilize the cells, the growing cells, the early development of the cells, and the final uh, completion of, of the urethane technology or urethane chemistry. So nucleation, that basically comes about from dissolved gases and liquid reactants, uh, primarily the um, polyols and isocyanates. It can also come about from low boiling liquids that are added to the system. John, you talked about blowing agents such as carbon dioxide, acetone, methylene chloride, and, and, and others. And of course, carbon dioxide is also a byproduct of the chemistry that John eloquently presented to us. Um, and finally, gases that are released from decomposable additives in the formulation. This isn't that commonly used in this industry, but I guess it can be. I think primarily it's gases that are dissolved in the ingredients or perhaps sometimes entrained within the uh, raw material ingredients. And then through work, they come out of solution and they nucleate into bubbles. So when we talk about nucleation, I just mentioned it takes work to nucleate a bubble. And some of the early work, um, gosh, so this goes back to the 19th century, but specifically within, within urethanes, it was work that was published by Kanner and, Del and, Kanner and Becker um, back in the carbide days. And uh, they showed that you know, to work is equal to, let me just say proportional to the radius of the bubble and then also the surface tension. So if we want to spontaneously nucleate a very small bubble, it takes a tremendous amount of work. And the force is proportional to surface tension 
and inversely proportional to the radius. So, within that work, they calculated that for a bubble of CO2 gas, it takes 40, 454 joules per gram. Thereby, spontaneous or homogeneous nucleation is unfavorable and highly unlikely. So in most cases, when we nucleate foam, it's all done heterogeneously. And of course, surfactant plays a major role here by lowering that surface tension and favoring the nucleation, and then after that, the stabilization of the, of the bubbles. All right, so nucleation comes about from, there are some low pressure, high shear, so in the trailing edge of the mixer blades, and there's some work that was published um, in England by Graham Walmsley, I want to say back probably in the 60s, that, that actually showed this, and um, also alternatively high pressure, low shear, here nucleation comes about through the pressure drop, going from from a high pressure low flow to a low pressure high flow going through an orifice or something like that. So when you pressure, going through a pressure drop, you get nucleation of bubbles, very simplistically. For bubbles to grow, you need to have a pressure differential. So there's got to be a, a small bubble and a big bubble. And the diffusion takes place from a small bubble, which is an area of higher pressure, to the bigger bubble, an area of lower pressure. But it also takes place from the CO2 molecules that are evolved from the reaction of the water and the isocyanate, and they diffuse into, into these bubbles. Again, you see here that surface tension plays a major role, as does the uh, radius of the bubbles. So gas diffuses from high pressure to low pressure, as I mentioned, and surfactants are very important in this process. Okay, so moving on to equipment. Beginning with laboratory. And I think, John, you showed some pictures. You, you mentioned, um, you know, foaming within the laboratory. It's, it's a process that's done, obviously a very important process, done in development efforts. And it begins with, uh, or it's, it's carried out to evaluate new raw materials. It's done to determine the cream and rise times. These are characteristics of primarily the reactivity, which will give us an indication of how this chemistry will perform when we take it out to a production line. Um, and through that, we can determine the amounts of catalysts and surfactant levels that are required. So the process involves uh, basically a, some kind of container, a bucket, if you will, on a balance. The raw materials or the ingredients are added to that. There's mixing that takes place. Then the isocyanate is the last thing that, that is added to that. The reaction begins. And it's stirred for a certain period of time, usually less than 10 seconds. Here it says 3 to 6 seconds at, at some rate of um, revolution. And then it's poured into some kind of vessel, and then we observe the rising foam. So this. And I think the camera will zoom in and we can actually watch the foam rise. This takes place um, in a period of less than typically, you know, about a minute and a half, but less than two minutes. So John talked about different features that we in the urethane industry um, look at. He talked about the cream time. Uh, that's the time typically when it goes from a clear, low viscosity liquid mixture to an opaque, higher viscosity uh, cream that, that resembles shaving cream. We look at the, where the rise time is, which is uh, where, where it reaches its maximum height, and typically it's followed by what we call blow-off, which you can see some surface activity. It looks like there are small bubbles that are, that are coming through the surface where the uh, gas is released. That's a cell opening phenomenon that takes place. All those are characteristics and will give us an indication of how this chemistry will perform when we take it out on the production line. The next step up, moving up from the laboratory, is what we call pilot scale or pilot machines. Typically, these machines exist within the uh, raw material supplier base. Um, it's a very good tool for evaluating the chemistry and giving us a good indication of how it's going to do when we do take it out to, again, a production machine, when it's introduced to a foam manufacturer. 
There are a few phone manufacturers that have pilot scale machines as well. Again, it's a good tool because it's, it's a way to scale up from the laboratory and go through that transition before going to full scale. Bear in mind that uh, full scale is 800 pounds to 1,000 pounds a minute of raw materials um, on a continuous uh, scale, so that can add up a lot of material, chew up a lot of material as well as cost. So having a pilot machine is, is a very good tool. All right, now we go to um, full-scale machines, and these are classifications of the machines, beginning with low pressure. Basically, that uh, is a characteristic of how the raw materials are delivered to the mixing vessel or the mix head, primarily the isocyanate. Then we go to high-pressure machines, and within the high-pressure machines, these are uh, the brands of the three CO2 type of machines. John talked about CO2 um, as, as a blowing agent. And then we have some specialty machines that we're going to talk about here as well. And I'll go through each of these in, in some level of detail. First, the uh, low pressure machine, starting with direct laydown. Direct laydown refers to directly laying the material, the reacting material. So at this point, we've introduced all the ingredients, including the isocyanate. And it's mixed in this chamber here, and it's directly laid onto a conveyor where it begins to rise, as you can see in this picture here. This picture has um, what's called a spreader bar, which allows the material to spread from one side to the other side, covering the width of the, uh, the machine. And we have a video here that shows such a process. So what you see here is um, instead of the spreader bar that was shown in the picture before, you have what's called a traverse. Basically, it's to ensure that we cover um, the, a good distribution of the material from one side to the other side. Uh, primarily, when you're producing foam, you want to be very efficient. And in order to do that, you need to have a very good, what's called a good profile of the foam. So you want the buns to be flat. Uh, you want to make sure that the material spreads out all the way from one side to the other. So what we see here is... Uh, what looks like basically shaving cream. So this material has gone through, has, is well nucleated, so there's a lot, of, a lot of bubbles that exist in this material. There's some kind of cheesecloth or something on the end of it. That's basically just to sort of regulate. It gives you a little bit of back pressure, but it also helps regulate the bubbles. And um, you also saw some lines, some dark lines going through there. Those, these lines right here are... Um, concentrations of different cell size bubbles, but as the foam as, as the foam reacts and as it expands, these it becomes significantly more homogeneous in appearance than what you see here in, in the onset. The other thing that you're seeing here is a startup. And as every engineer knows that when you, in every process, when you have multiple streams coming in, uh, right when you start up, you're not at steady state. And that's certainly the case with all foam machines. So what you have here is a um, non-stoichiometric mix of the reacting ingredients. So you will have probably a polyol rich. I think most machines are like that. Ours are set up like that. We're rich in polyol, so we're under index. There's a delay in the isocyanate coming in that's uh, designed intentionally into the equipment to ensure that we do have every stream uh, come through before we introduce isocyanate and, and begin the reaction. Okay, so we have direct lay down. We just saw videos of it. There are pros and cons to this, like there is to everything, but um, I'll, I'll just touch upon a few of these. I think the important thing here is that uh, direct lay down has, is, is one method of doing it, of, of producing foam. So it typically goes along with low pressure. There's, um, it says here, no need to highly filter the materials. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later when we get into some of the CO2 foaming. But you can use a lot of, a lot of filler. As John mentioned, he talked about filler and, and, and filled polyols, graft, copolymer, and other uh, fillers as well. Uh, can be used to create squirrel patterns if that's, if that's a desire. I think the most important thing with the direct lay down, and, and I have a lot of experience with it. I worked for a company, we did everything direct lay down. It's that it's the most effective way for controlling the cell size. And you have very consistent cell size. So if you're selling products based on the pore size, which in a lot of markets uh, we do, 
Um, not necessarily in furniture and bedding, but there are other technical markets that do sell on, on the size of the cells. Liquid or direct lay down is, is the way to go because you, there you can have very specific control of the cell size. So that's really the biggest, the biggest um, advantage to direct lay down. Uh, the cons are you have to, it's, it's not very forgiving. So you're going to have knit lines, you're going to have what's called striations where you, it looks like there's a pattern in the foam and you're looking at a cut surface of it, um, either in the vertical or horizontal. Uh, there is some cleanup, but there is cleanup in, in really just about any method that we do this. And unfortunately, you don't have the most efficient profile of the bond. So there's typically higher waste that goes along with direct lay down. Um, there are machines that do direct lay down and they have flat topping, they have RS systems. These are methods of trying to get a square profile of the bond so you minimize the amount of waste on the skins. And, um, and But these are uh, just generally speaking some of the pros and cons of, of this method. Alternatively, we can pour foam using a trough. This is more commonly the way foam is poured in, in North America. And here you have a vessel, as you can see here. So the, all the reacting ingredients come into the mixer here. Again, th this portion is very similar to what we just saw. The difference is now it goes into a vessel. This vessel allows the reaction to begin. It allows it to build a little bit of viscosity before it spills over onto the conveyor. So it's a little, uh, it's quite a bit more forgiving and it's easier to pour foam using this method. Uh, maintaining, containing the reacting mass of material when it has some viscosity to it is easier than if it was liquid. You don't have to worry about uh, knit lines and striations and those kinds of things. Um, you still have that, the steady state issues at the beginning like you did with direct lay down. So I think we have a video of this as well. Now in this video, this particular case, um, they decided to start out pouring directly out of the hose and right into just a, a startup block, a little box. And I think once it reached steady state, once they saw that the isocyanate had come in, you can see that it's starting to react because it becomes opaque. And um, then they placed the, the nozzle into the trough itself and proceeded to, to start the foaming. Everybody, there is no, as we say, there's more than one way to skin a cat, so there's no right way or wrong way to do it. Um, I, I know that a lot of companies go directly into the trough without starting up like this, and, and that is perfectly fine as well. So it looks here like this is some type of R&D um, experiment because they're, they're marking the bonds as they, as they change the... Uh, whatever they're doing, the experiments they're doing. So there are pros and cons to this as it works with direct lay down. Here, um, the pros are, again, you can use a lot of solid, like you can with direct lay down, as opposed to CO2 foaming, which should be the next thing you show. Uh, here, you can maximize your yield. So that's one advantage that you get with a, a trough type system and max foam systems. You have very tall bonds, you have maximum yields, you have very square bonds, and it's, it's the process that's preferred when, when maximum yield is desired, which is typically the case in furniture and bedding markets. Of course, you have to, and I already mentioned, you know, the trough helps you build viscosity, so it's easier to, to contain the material as it spills over onto the conveyor. Some of the cons, uh, you have the trough buildup, so you have to, there's a lot of cleanup that comes, comes with this. Um, there is more buildup with a trough system than there is with a direct lay down. But as I'll show you in just a second here, there's also significant buildup and, and cleaning that has to be done with a CO2-based system. And another con is that um, you really have very little control on the cell structure. There is some, but not as much as you do with direct lay down. And you have a bigger dispersity in cell size with, with the trough. Often you'll have some bubbles or some holes that either coalesce and they're larger in size and they carry on all the way through the process. So when you do look at a cut surface of a foam, you'll see some holes in there. It's very typical with a trough type uh, manufacturing process. Moving on, so we talked about direct lay down, we talked about a trough, and now we're, now we're uh, going back to somewhat of a direct lay down, but in here uh, we've changed the, the pressure drop phenomenon from the actual mix head 
now to what's called a creamer or a spreader bar or a bell or something like that because we're introducing um, CO2, whether it's supersaturated or liquid CO2 is, is debatable, but they we're introducing CO2 at a very high pressure at a cold temperature into the polyol. The polyol is at an elevated temperature, uh, excuse me, an ele elevated pressure to contain the CO2 dissolved until we go through the letdown process or the pressure drop process so we begin the nucleation. All the, there are three main um, developers of this technology that have equipment that they sell. The concepts are similar in that they're all at higher pressure when the CO2 is introduced to the polyol and they go through some type of pressure reduction device to allow for nucleation for the foaming to begin. First we begin with the cardio system, it's Canon Viking CO2 system. Here we have um, a gate bar, sometimes it's called a spreader bar I guess, but it's uh, typically called a gate bar. And it's a gate bar that has a gap in here. So the material at some elevated pressure, you have all the, all the uh, reacting ingredients, you have the isocyanate that comes in, the polyol, all the other additives that John talked about in his session. There is a, and then you have liquid CO2 that comes in as well um, through this manifold. It goes through the mixer, still at a significantly higher pressure than what we had in the previous two cases that I presented. And then it goes through the pressure letdown device. In this case, the pressure letdown device is this gate bar, the gap of which is adjusted based on the amount of CO2 that's added into the formulation. So the more CO2, the more you want to hold it in pressure, the higher the pressures, that type of thing. Here the gap is typically um, 200 to 500 microns. And this process allows for, is more favorable if you're adding um, fillers and other solids, more favorable than some of the other processes. Although all processes are now capable of handling fillers to a certain extent. I think we have a video here showing a, a cardio system. <clears throat> And what you'll notice immediately here is the consistency of the material is very different coming out of the device here than it was in the previous two cases. When it was a direct lay down, you can see that there's liquid being laid down and then it went through the creaming process. Same thing with the trough. Um, the trough was liquid, it went through the creaming process um, as it was spilling over. In this case, it comes out of, as a cream. It comes out as, looks like Gillette shaving cream. And that's designed intentionally uh, to do that. So you have the nucleation takes place here, not back up in the mix head. Again, we've got some pros and cons with this process. Um, one of the things that I mentioned earlier is you can use filled polyols. Uh, this is more favorable in this process than the other processes, although they can all handle that now. Um, you have to change, or you can change the shims to change the pressure, and uh, you adjust the pressure depending on the amount of CO2 and there's something that's called the airless type bar. So I mentioned uh, nucleation very early on. In almost every process we have to add some type of uh, nucleation, nucleating gas, typically nitrogen, including direct lay down, inclu including trough to a certain extent, as well as CO2 processes. Cardio requires less nucleating gas than some of the other processes. Um, so that's, I guess, one of the advantages. There are some disadvantages. We're dealing with much higher pressures. There's a tremendous amount of cleanup that takes place. You have a lot of buildup. And if you want to change from one grade to another, which is often done in our industry, you have a transition. Um, with, with this process and with most CO2 processes, it's very difficult to make dramatic changes in grades uh, on the fly. So you have to shut down and start up again. And obviously there's costs associated with that. There's material waste and everything else that goes along with the shutdown. So that's something that we don't like to do in, in manufacturing. The second one is a NovoFlex. This, was, this is a technique that was developed by Henneke. Um, here, instead of a gate bar, you have a creamer. And you have a series of sieves and screens and they go in in a certain pattern, a certain uh, method, and you have then the pressure letdown that goes through this process as well. So it it's, takes place within the sift pack, as they call it, or within inside the creamer. The process is similar in that you introduce CO2 into the polyol, you have it elevated pressures, you have the, the polyols that come in here, the additives that come in, 
here, sorry, into the mix head, and then everything is mixed with the isocyanate and the water into the mix head. Then it goes over, as you can see the host here, that comes from the mix head and it comes over into the creamer. And I believe there's a video that shows this process as well. So it's similar to what we saw with cardio. The exception here is that um, the material needs to spread from one side to the other on its own, as opposed to having that gate bar which distributes the material. And you can see the consistency of the material coming out looks very similar to what it looked like with the, with the cardio system. So as you might imagine, you have very similar advantages and disadvantages to uh, Novaflex as you do with cardio, in the sense that you'll have a lot of cleanup to do in here when this is all finished. And because there is a series of screens and, and sieves that um, go in here, the, the number of sieves, the type of sieves, the, the sequence that they go in is, is dependent upon the formulation. So obviously dependent upon the CO2 in the formulation. And again, if you want to change from one grade to another on the fly, you can do that if the grades are very similar. But when you want to make dramatic changes to it, you have to stop, shut down, change the sift pack, and go to a different sift pack. Just like you had to change these shims in the, uh, in the cardio system. So we have the sift pack, um, high pressure foaming, again, allows for CO2. You have a very uniform cell structure with this method. I think a lot of people would say that probably one of the more uniform cell structures are provided by a, a Henneke um, Novaflex system. Uh, you get good yields by flat topping, and it does allow for some changes in the formulation on the fly. Some of the cons are very similar to what I already mentioned earlier. You have a lot of cleanup, there's some buildup, uh, filter, which you don't want it to happen. If it plugs up and it can it overpressurize, you can blow up, so there is a safety concern there as well. And here is the other con that I've already mentioned about switching formulations on the fly. The last CO2 method, CO2 foaming method, is one that was developed by a company named BMEC. Here, this is similar to the other two in the sense that, again, you have a device here that's downstream of our mix head. This is where nucleation takes place. This is where the pressure drop takes place. In this case, you don't have a gate bar. You don't have a series of screens or sieves. You have one centered disc that acts as a, uh, as a sieve. And I think we have a video as well for this one. No, maybe not. I guess we don't. Okay. Well, it, would, it would look very similar to what we saw with the uh, Novaflex system. Again, the, the, the pros and the cons here are very similar to what we had with Novaflex. So you have very good uh, homogeneous nucleation. You don't need to add a lot of um, other added nucleation, so for example, nitrogen. Uh, the cons are very similar. You have cleanup, a lot of cleanup to do. You, it's, you're limited to the amount of uh, grades that you can change on the fly. And then you, if you overpressurize, you have that safety concern as well. So moving on to um, another, another method, another type of equipment that's used in manufacturing of uh, urethane foam. It's called variable pressure foaming. In this case, instead of using a blowing agent to reduce the density of the foam, um, the foam is either produced under sub-atmospheric or above atmospheric conditions. So you can pull a vacuum on the reacting foam mixture to reduce the density and soften the foam as opposed to adding a physical blowing agent. This is a method that's still used within our industry by, by um, a few manufacturers. Um, a couple, I think. And in this case, as you can see here, it's like um, pouring foam in a pressure vessel. It is pouring foam in a pressure vessel. So the ingredients are mixed. After they mix, they enter the uh, pressure vessel. And again, it can be run under vacuum or it can be run under pressure. There is a series of interlocks here that allows that once the buns are cut, so it is a continuous process, but you do have um, they're, they're cut to certain lengths depending on, on the application. So you have blocks of foam that are cut and then they go through a series of interlocks to reduce the pressure before they come out of the vessel. 
And then finally, a discontinuous method of producing foam is what's called bo box foaming. This is very similar to what we saw in a laboratory scale. It's just done on a, large, on a much larger scale. Uh, this is a process that is more conducive for things, um, for applications that are specialized applications or more technical applications. It's not a method that would typically be used in high volume, high, high production rate uh, environment. It's obviously less efficient than a continuous process um, when you're looking at uh, yields, maximizing yields, and again do, running at high volumes and, and high rates. Um, it can be more efficient if you're producing much smaller volumes. So if it's a specialized or a niche type of application and um, you don't want to run it on a very large machine that takes a tremendous amount of material to start up and run and then shut down, this is the, the right type of equipment for that type of application. So as I mentioned, it's very similar to a laboratory environment. You have polyol, you have a blending tank here where you're adding the, uh, the adi additives, so your catalyst or surfactant, any other additives that you want to add to it. Then you have um, your isocyanate on this side, PDI or MDI, or any other isocyanate for that matter, and then the catalyst, the tank catalyst goes in here. It's all metered into a mixing vessel. It mixes for a while, and then the liquid, uh, there's a little door that opens up at the bottom here. The liquid is dispensed into the bottom of this uh, vessel, um, and it begins to react. And this one, we do have a video. So you can see the door here that opened up, it closes, they're moving the box away, they're going to close the door on the box here, and then the foam will begin to rise in this box as it would in a laboratory environment. I noticed that in this case, as in all cases, there is uh, ventilation. John talked about safety concerns and engineering controls. What you're noticing here is um, a little plate, if you will, that's, will be, that's designed to uh, float or positioned right on top of the rising foam. So it will rise as the foam rises itself. And it's really designed to eliminate the natural crown that takes place in, in foam production. So you can see the top here rising, and it's really designed to push the material out to the edges so that you get a flat surface on top. So when the uh, skin is removed, and again, it's kind of like removing the crust from your bread. <laughs> uh, when the skin is removed and you have the, the usable foam in the, in the middle, you minimize the amount of waste from the crown. Continuous processes also have similar ways of, of getting a flatter top. I mentioned an RS system. Basically, that's, that's uh, pulling up on the sides of, of the foam as it's moving down the conveyor on the sidewall of the foam, so it pulls up the sides to ensure that the liquid, expanding liquid, increases or rises at a rate faster than the rate in the center to make sure that uh, you get a flat, um, a flat bun profile. In addition to that, there is flat topping that takes place on a continuous process. It's similar to what you saw here. Um, you have a set of skis that come down, rest right on the surface of the foam to push the center of the foam out to the edges. Another method that has been developed in our industry for producing foam, and again, it's, it's, it's to maximize yield, and if you're getting the idea that pouring foam is all about maximizing yields, it, it really is. Um, and in this case, this is a method that produces foam continuously, but in a vertical orientation as opposed to a horizontal orientation, hence the name vertifoam. So the foam mixture is introduced at the bottom here, it, and it rises in a vertical, and in this case, you have a perfect square profile when you're looking at a cross-section of a foam. So you have very, very little waste. So you minimize the waste, you maximize the yield in this case. Um, it can either be produced in a circular or, or round block, as we call it. Um, this allows the foam to be peeled or fabricated in rolls with, with minimal amount of waste or again, in a square block, which also minimizes the waste. All right, moving on to um, um, carpet padding. 
And the process, again, all the processes are similar. You have, as, as, as you've seen up until this point, polyol and isocyanates coming to a mixing vessel, then they're laid onto some kind of uh, conveyor. And in this case, it's, um, you have some heaters to help drive the cure. And then it's taken up here in a roll, there's embossing. But um, there's a method for making carpet pad, and, and this is virgin carpet pad as they call it, and it is a continuous process as you've seen here with uh, polyurethane foam for uh, you know, slab stock applications, furniture, bedding, and other applications. Froth foam, this is a little different. This is mechanically froth, so the, the nucleation is done through mechanical means, high shear mixing, high shear steering, so you're whipping air into it as if you were making meringue. And then, to um, some very specialized surfactants, the reacting mixture is stabilized for a period of time as it is applied to the back of the carpet, and then it goes through a normal process here through an oven for curing, and then it's taken up and rolled up. So this is applied to the back of a carpet directly. And here's carpet padding that has a coating on it. It can be a, a film um, or, or any other type of coating. A similar process, the coating comes through, the foam is applied onto the, onto the backing, and it goes to a set of heaters again, and then it's taken up as finished carpet. So it's, it's all a very similar process. Backing up a little bit and talking about the uh, mixing type of devices, we showed pictures of, or we saw some, some uh, mixers running. There was a pin type of mixer, and then there's a high shear type. Uh, there's a picture of it, or a diagram of it here. It's, it's not coming through very, very well. This here is the pin. Basically, there are a series of pins, and as they spin at a certain uh, rate, um, it carries out the mixing. And then here we have a high shear, so you have uh, different size. Uh, blades that have significantly higher shear than, than the pin type. Flat topping, I already mentioned that. There's something called forced air cooling. John talked about the uh, reaction, uh, urethane reactions being exo exothermic, so the foam heats up, naturally heats up as it's being produced. Uh, to minimize, to drive the cure and minimize variations in the properties within a very large bun, Several manufacturers will do forced air cooling, so it'll drive cool air through the foam to bring the temperature down to a point where you basically quench the, the, the reactions. We talked about the CO2 systems. Of course, you need storage tanks with any of these methods to store the raw materials, pumps to pump the raw materials to the process, temperature and process controls. Just about every manufacturing facility that, that I've been in has some type of temperature control on the major components, polyol isocyanate, um, and perhaps a few others as well. Pressure sensors to make sure that we have um, for safety concerns and also to make sure that we're in control of our processes, both high pressure sensors, low pressure sensors. Just about most of the operations now are based on uh, PLC control. Something else that's um, not mentioned up here, but more and more facilities have these now, and that's feedback control. So we have flow meters, whether they're uh, mass flow meters or, uh, or some other type of flow meters. Um, just about every facility now has installed those on, on your important or major components, critical components, to ensure that we're getting the right flow, so we get the right, right chemistry. And I think, John, you mentioned that foaming is, is an art. You know, I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, I said it's a mixture of engineering and chemistry. There is a little bit of what we in the industry call black magic. And so that's, uh, formulation libraries are very important because you draw upon your experiences in the history of producing foam and developing new formulations. That's sort of the black magic. I guess uh, today being the 31st of October, everybody's making great foam today. Um, I called our facility and we made the best foam we've made all year. Uh, ventilation systems uh, for, for safety uh, purposes. Uh, the fumes often have, you know, there's off gassing that takes place during the foaming process. These uh, fumes have to be ventilated, collected, and often they go through scrubbers to remove 
to remove any air pollutants from, from those. And then paper and films to contain, you saw that in, in all the videos, there's film or paper and or paper to help contain the reacting mass onto the conveyor. Now, we, up until this point, I've talked about slab stock uh, foaming, switching gears, talking about molded foaming. And we have several um, experts, much better experts in the audience than myself, so uh, handy if I make a mistake here, let me know. But um, molded foams involve pouring the reactive mixture into a mold, as, as the name uh, insinuates. So here it eliminates the process of having to post, to do something to the bun after you produce it. But here it's, the foam is, is poured into a mold, so it takes the shape of the final application or the final product. And I'm going to talk a little bit about fabrication later on, so you'll see why there's an advantage to molding. It, it lends itself nicely for products that have intricate shapes, like car seats, headrests, armrests, steering wheels, those types of things. Um, there is, in this case, you see here a carousel, so this is a series of molds that, that go around. You have your mixing head here that dispenses material into the mold. And as, an, as this turns, the foaming mass begins to react, it expands, it fills the mold, and it takes the shape of, of the final product. As far as tankage, similar to slab stock foaming, tankage is required for the raw materials. In this case, typically less tankage, because a lot of the raw materials are pre-blended before, uh, before uh, being molded. You have a mix head as we do in slab stock foaming, uh, and of course you have molds and mold carousels here as opposed to a conveyor. Here are a few pictures of um, some molding machines. You see the, uh, the pumps on this side, the tanks over here, and you know, there should be a, yeah, here's a mix head here. So you can see uh, the raw materials, usually a, a three components, uh, two or three, sometimes more components coming into it. There's a, a line that brings the material in and then there's a return line. Mix heads are typically automated this, these days, which means there's some type of device, uh, typically a robot, that moves the mix head over and pours the material into the mold. Um, here it states that there's a boom or a pour bridge. Uh, multiple molds are required. They're typically on a carousel or a racetrack. You'll see a diagram of that. Uh, the molds are generally made from, from aluminum. And um, they're often, it's often required to spray some type of mold release into the, into the mold to allow demolding of the part so it doesn't stick to the mold. So here's a diagram of a carousel. You have operators here and here. There's the uh, the mix head is here, so it dispenses the material into the mold. Um, they can be either closed or they can be open and they can close later, like a clamshell type. And as it goes around, it goes to a often um, a curing oven. It doesn't have to be. It can be either hot, hot cured or cold cured. And as it goes through this curing oven, then it comes to a station here where there's demolding, so the part is removed from the mold, the mold is cleaned, and then re-waxed again, and this whole process is repeated. So, as you might imagine, the chemistry is slightly different here. Uh, the key here is to maximize the, the productivity here, so we want these things to spit out as many parts as fast as possible, so you're going to kick the reactivity a little bit. So there are different types of polyols that, that react a little bit faster, the catalysts are a little different, and um, so you have slightly different uh, characteristics and properties of the foam as well compared to slap stock operation. And we have a video of a single mold. This is obviously in a laboratory environment, but you'll get the idea of, of the molding process. So the mold was poured, poured into, uh, or the material was poured into the mold through some type of opening here. Then it was uh, closed off and sealed. Um, I didn't notice the stopwatch, but probably what would you say a minute or so? 
and then it was demolded. Six minutes. Right. That's the that's the full cycle. Yeah. Okay, John talked about safety, so I, I really think I'm going to skip through this slide. Um, obviously, every material has to be handled and um, respected for its um, hazards that it could bring, uh, including polyols, but especially isocyanates. And John talked about the hazards of TDI and MDI. It is a sensitizer. There are uh, specific guidelines as to the PPE that's required when working with these materials, and again, the engineering controls and ventilation that's required as well. John mentioned um, OSHA's uh, levels for exposure, the you know, limits, uh, exposure limits that, that are published, and every manufacturer that, that I have visited that I know of is, has engineering controls to ensure that none of their workforce are exposed to, to TDI or MDI or any other hazardous material. Now I added a section here that was not part of this presentation in previous years, and this is one that's very near and dear to me. Uh, John touched upon it. He mentioned reticulated foam. I had the pleasure in, uh, recently in a chapter in my life to lead a team that um, designed, built, implemented and started up a reticulation process and it was probably one of the um, one of the greatest experiences I had and if there are any static physicists in the room this would be a dream job for you because the engineers had 28 pages of nothing but equations on this page and we were designing this this piece of equipment so reticulation reticulation or reticulated foam according to Wikipedia is a very porous, low-density solid foam. So reticulation, the, the word reticulated means a net or resembling, resembling a, a net. So the process of reticulation is a process that, as you can see in this picture, which is very typical of a urethane foam that's freshly uh, produced off the pore line, um, maybe there are a few more windows in here than is typical, but what you see here are these films indicate that the majority of the cells have not ruptured, have not opened yet. Um, often in just the natural slab stock process you'll get a certain percentage of cells that do open but far from 100% uh, are open. So the process of reticulation is a post-treatment process that um, renders the foam fully open. So as you can see in this picture here. So this very likely is the exact same piece of foam before and after reticulation. And you can see here that all the windows have been removed and the only thing that's remaining is the skeletal structure. So pore sizes range from 4 to PPI. Basically PPI stands for pores per inch and you can take a um, some kind of measuring device like a ruler, lay it across here and count the cells. So this would be 1, 2, 3, 4. This would be an inch there if it was 4 PPI or you could count up to 100 of them in, for 100 PPI foam. And I actually have samples of these. I was going to bring them down, but I, they're upstairs in my hotel room. So if I remember, I may bring them to the bar later and um, show them to everyone. So void volumes are 98%. So there's very little solid material remaining when after this reticulation process. And this is a key feature here, because one of the applications, I had a customer that uses this material in, in growing um, bacteria for water treatment applications. And they said that there's no other media that compares to a polyurethane foam and because of this feature here. So 2,000 square feet of surface area per cubic foot of foam. That's tremendous surface area. Some of the um, attributes of reticulated foam filtration, John, you mentioned that. That's got to be, it is number one. It's the, the biggest um, characteristic of it, the biggest uh, end use filtration, but also absorbing, wicking. Um, everybody knows inkjet cartridges use reticulated foam in them, dispensing, and then energy absorbing. Here are examples of some of the applications. This here is actually a ceramic foam. A reticulated polyurethane foam is used as the precursor to making the ceramic foam. 
It's uh, dipped in a slurry and then baked. The organic part or the polyurethane part completely volatilizes. What remains is ceramic skeletal. And this is used in the foundry industry. So uh, every aluminum component, whether it's a, a can of soda or an aluminum engine block is filtered as it's cast. It actually was uh, the development or the invention of ceramic filters that allowed for cans to go from thick gauges. I'm sure a lot of us in the room remember the old cans were very, very heavy, very solid, to very thin aluminum cans now because this process eliminates or removes um, inclusions in the molten mass of alloy, whether it's an aluminum, whether it's uh, iron, steel, or some other type of alloy. So that's one application. It's actually a quite large application of reticulated foam. Here you see an outdoor um, furniture. So they use reticulated foam in here that allows it to dry quickly. Here's an example of reticulated foam with water pouring through it. It just flows right through it as opposed to a non-reticulated foam which pours around the outside of it. Uh, another very important application, and this was a uh, development and invention by actually um, Lockheed Martin and the U.S. Air Force. Several, if not all, of our military planes and our allies' military planes, and specifically every C-130, has reticulated foam in the fuel systems, in the fuel tanks. And its design has two purposes. One is to, um, to prevent the plane from blowing up if it's hit by enemy fire. And secondly, it prevents sloshing or significant shifts in center of gravity of the plane when it's banking. And it's very important for planes of this size. So you see here um, a very simple diagram of a, of a fuel system that does not have reticulated foam in it. It gets hit by enemy fire, it will explode. And then here's one that has reticulated foam in it. The energy front from that, from that shot is absorbed by the foam itself and it prevents the explosion. There is a video and it's still on there because I checked it this morning, if you Google if you check YouTube and say uh, explosion suppression foam, there's a video that the U.S. Army has on there that you actually see where they, they fire a 50 round through a fuel tank with and without reticulated foam. And it's very dramatic what the reticulated foam does, uh, does for the plane there. This right here um, is a Briggs and Stratton engine and you can see this is the filter foam. So we mentioned filtration. Uh, that's a common theme here among reticulated foam. So this is obviously used as an air filter. Down here, this is a wound care application. Again, it's used as a filter media that's placed directly within the wound bed. And then this is a shot back filter. So the process very simply involves taking the block of foam that has come up the production line, typically a slab stock production line. A direct lay down production line is very typical in producing foam um, that will be reticulated. It's introduced into a chamber and then the, uh, within the chamber you have stoichiometric amounts of hydrogen and oxygen that are then ignited. Um, there is uh, an explosion that takes place and that actually melts the film and blows its cells away and renders the foam reticulated. Okay. So continue with fabrication equipment because if you think about it in the, in the loose sense of the word, reticulation is a type of fabrication. It's something that we do to the foam after we produce the foam. Other types of fabrication, and this is all of these involve basically cutting the blocks of foam into smaller shapes um, that are designed to take the form that the foam will be used in, in its final application. Beginning with a, a looper or loop slitter, here you have very long buns that are fed to a carousel. Often it looks like a Ferris wheel. As this thing spins, there's a blade in here and it shaves a layer of foam from the inside. So it's a peeling process, if you will. It it's, it's allows for the production of rolls of foam, very long rolls of foam with minimal seams in it. It's a method that's used primarily for um, automotive foam and headliners and also in bedding foam. Vertical cutters, you can see here, this basically slices the foam vertically, so we have sheets of foam. <clears throat> there are several types of vertical cutters. Here we talk about CAD and CNC. 
Um, this is a common thing. It's often said in our industry that anybody with a saw can enter the fabrication business. And it's true that the barrier to entry is very low, but so is the probability of succeeding in fabrication business because there is such a low barrier. There's a tremendous amount of uh, capacity, not capacity, well capacity, but there's a lot of uh, companies that are doing fabrication. So the key to being a successful fabricator is to being really efficient. And this is where engineering comes into play. Some of the best industrial engineers um, are in this space here. Okay, so here we have horizontal cutters. So if you cut the foam vertically, you want to cut it horizontally. Sorry, if you cut the foam vertically, yeah, now you want to cut it horizontally so you get the three-dimensional shapes out of it. Again, the, uh, the latest technology is driven by CNC type cutters, CAD, so you can load a design and um, the computer will optimize, uh, optimize the pattern so you can maximize the yield that comes out of a block of foam. A lot of them have vacuum on the tables here. That's basically just to hold the foam down as it's being cut. And as I mentioned earlier, the key is accuracy and efficiency when, when cutting foam. So in almost all slab stock processes, when you make big buns, they require post, post fabrication. So some type of cutting to get, the, again, the, to get the foam in the, in the final shape for its use. And I mentioned earlier in molded foam, seldom is, it, is fabrication required. Other types of cutting uh, operations involve hot wire cutters. This is when you're cutting intricate shapes, um, contour, three-dimensional type of cutting, compression cutting. Here the block of foam is compressed and then a vertical or horizontal cut is, is, takes place and once the compression is released you get the negative of the uh, compression. So you have that image into the foam itself. Convoluting is another type of uh, fabrication. Um, I'm sure everybody has seen this, primarily in, in mattresses, uh, this egg crate looking type material. Here the, you have two wheels that compress the foam. There is a single blade there that moves along horizontally and makes a straight cut into the foam. Once the foam is released on the other side of the two wheels here, you have this pattern here. So the pattern is actually um, placed into the foam through the compression, not necessarily, it's, it's not cut like that. It's actually a vertical or a horizontal cut that takes place. And then some uh, more specialized type of cutting, you have water jet cutting. This is typically used in, in harder type of uh, foams and that you need high accuracy as well and that requires some sophisticated cutting and then laser cutting. So this is similar to, uh, to a water jet cutting. Um, instead of uh, a stream of water, it uses a laser. And that's it.